I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. The government is still open for business. We'll take a look at the winners and losers in the budget battle. Plus, it's a pilgrimage from one end of New York to the other. It's a marvelous walk with God from uh, up a, a Mother Cabrini down to Lower Manhattan, and it's a beautiful day. And in the run-up to Holy Week, kids in the Brooklyn Diocese get a blessing from the bishop. And we must rely on the innocence of our children still to recognize the love of God. Well, good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. After having narrowly averted a government shutdown over the budget, Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill are gearing up for more fighting over how and how much to cut government spending. The White House says President Obama will soon let the nation know his views on how to get the deficit under control. Republicans say they'll roll up their sleeves and fight for more budget slashing. CNN's Barbara Hall has more. There could be uphill battles ahead for President Obama and Congress on spending. The eyes appear to have it. The 2011 fiscal budget may be a done deal, but Republicans say more must be done to trim the government. The White House announced Sunday the president will lay out his plans for long-term deficit reduction this week. We need to take a scalpel, not a machete. That's senior advisor David Pluff, who promised a balanced approach to cuts and talked about areas the president will not be pillaging. We're not going to win the future in this country unless we invest in education, in research and development, in innovation and infrastructure. So that's going to be his North Star in these spending decisions. Republicans, meanwhile, are asking the president to heed a message of austerity. We've had our nation's first trillion dollar deficit, second trillion dollar deficit, third trillion dollar deficit, highest in the nation's history. At some point, you got to quit spending money you don't have. Meanwhile, the Treasury says the legal limit on the amount of money the U.S. can borrow will be reached by mid-May. In what could be another big fiscal fight in Congress, Republicans say they won't support raising the so-called debt ceiling unless more big steps are taken towards deficit reduction. Well, that is Barbara Hall reporting. So what are those big steps? Well, you know, one of the major budget battles has been waged over federal funding for Planned Parenthood. The budget that lawmakers signed off on for the remainder of the fiscal year keeps tax dollars for Planned Parenthood intact, but the Senate will vote on eliminating those funds as part of a separate bill. For more of all this, I spoke earlier today with Marjorie Dannenfelser, the president of the pro-life group, the Susan B. Anthony List. All right, Marjorie Dannenfelser, thanks so much for joining us here today on Currents. We appreciate your time. So happy to be here with you, Matt. Well, no problem at all. Glad to have you. Now, I just wanted to get your reaction, first of all, to this budget deal struck by lawmakers um, late in the hours on Friday night. Well, it's a, uh, it's a bipolar moment. <laughs> Intensely disappointed about uh, uh, Planned Parenthood funding not being stripped in any way. Uh, on the other hand, I'm very happy uh, that the uh, funding of abortion in the District of Columbia um, is is now not going to happen. <laughs> we were able to achieve a great victory after a lot of work. Um, and the reason that's such a great victory is um, it really amounts to about a thousand um, children a year that will be saved in the District of Columbia by keeping taxpayers out of the abortion business. Sure. Now that that, that you're referring to, that's the Dornan Amendment, correct? That's right. It's the Dornan Amendment, named for California congressman from long ago. Sure, sure. Now, let me, j just for clarity, it, the Hyde Amendment, of course, is, is already deals with federal funding of abortion. Did that not um, have any effect in the District of Columbia? Is this, how, how does the Jordan effect, uh, the Jordan Amendment, rather, uh, have an effect on uh, D.C. in particular? Yeah, well, every appropriations bill um, that has, uh, has a connection to uh, abortion at all has to have a separate rider on it, a separate um, language that says none of the funds in this bill can be used for abortion. The Hyde Amendment is, is a rider on the um, Medicaid program. D.C. is a separate funding stream, so we have to attach a rider like that to every single spending bill. The Dornan, um, the Dornan Amendment affects only the spending, uh, only taxes in the District of Columbia. So the Hyde Amendment is actually the principle of the Hyde Amendment 
is um, something that's going to be voted on in the House pretty soon. So it would be a statutory um, ban on federal funding of abortion um, in all programs. So that's, of course, what we want, but we don't have. Gotcha. Okay. Well, now um, looking ahead, the funding of Planned Parenthood is something that will come up for a vote. Um, as part of this agreement, I understand, uh, yeah. an up or down vote by the Senate at a later time. What are your feelings about that? Well, it's a good thing because clarity is always good. Um, understanding where our senators stand on this is vital, especially given that the 2012 elections are coming up and there are quite a number of senators who we would like to see um, what their vote is on this. And, uh, and there are several. Claire McCaskill will be a good example in Missouri. Um, she is a strong defender of Planned Parenthood. We'd like to see that um, in a recorded vote. So we will be educating the voters in Missouri about uh, how she thinks their tax money ought to be spent. So it's valuable in that sense. Um, another thing that came out of this is uh, very valuable as well when it comes to 2012. Almost every single top-tier presidential candidate um, sent out a statement saying, that they uh, that they uh, are for privatizing Planned Parenthood, they're for keeping our money out of um, out of Planned Parenthood. So they have staked out their position now, and that is extremely valuable moving into the election. Um, Mitch Daniels is the only top tier candidate that um, has not made such a statement, and so um, that that'll be very helpful. I mean, it, the, again, clarity is everything uh, um, um, among men and women who are representing representing us. So many, many good things came out of this whole process, and, uh, and we want to celebrate our victory. Again, this is the first, uh, this is the, you know, this is just the first battle, and what we expect to be an ongoing one where we will, we will win um, eventually. We just need a little bit better set up in the Senate and in the uh, Oval Office. Sure, sure. Well, of course, we'll keep in touch with you uh, as we head along here, and uh, uh, you know, of course, we'll, we'll keep you at the front of the Rolodex and, and get more information from you <laughs> as we go along here. And as we approach 2012, I'm sure you'll be busy as we will. So we'll talk to you uh, before then. Well, you're a great partner, and I look forward to it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Marjorie. We appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, stay with us. There is much more currents ahead. Japan remembers the deadly earthquake and tsunami one month later. That story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. Coming up later, ahead of Palm Sunday, an annual tradition at a Brooklyn parish. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, on the one-month anniversary of Japan's 9.0 magnitude earthquake, the already shaken nation was hit again, this time by a magnitude 6.6 .6 quake. It came about an hour after Japanese officials called for more evacuations in the city in the area surrounding the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Meanwhile, across Japan today, people took time out to remember victims of the massive quake and subsequent tsunami that struck a month ago off the shores of Japan. More than 13,000 people are confirmed dead, another 15,000 still missing. The leader of the Catholic Church in Libya says warring factions in his country are at a military impasse. Apostolic Vicar of Tripoli Giovanni Martinelli says neither rebel forces nor those backing leader Muammar Gaddafi can prevail. Martinelli says Italy, which initially backed a diplomatic solution, should support Turkey's attempt to negotiate a ceasefire. Many Libyans and foreign nationals have sought refuge in Italy amid the ongoing unrest in the effort to oust Gaddafi from power. Meanwhile, could an end to the civil war in the Ivory Coast be near? Well, today may have seen the first step in that direction with the arrest of Laurent Gbagbo, who had refused to leave office after losing the presidential election last year. Forces loyal to the winner of the election stormed the presidential residence where Gbagbo had been hiding there is no news yet on the papal envoy to the Ivory Coast who had been unable to enter the country because no planes were flying there. Well, Beijing police have rounded up dozens of people from a Christian church not approved by the government there. The Christians were trying to hold a service in a public space after they were kicked out of their normal place of worship. China's communist government only allows worship in state-approved churches. Meanwhile, the Vatican is holding meetings to look at ways to address the problems of the Catholic Church in China. Rome Reports has the details. 
The Vatican is holding a three-day meeting with members of the Roman Curia who have experience on the problems facing the Church in China. They will speak with members of the Chinese Episcopate to get their first-hand accounts. Tensions between Rome and China escalated last November over the illicit ordination of a Chinese bishop. However, more recently, the two parties gave joint approval for the ordination of a new bishop in the Chinese diocese of Zhengmen. The Vatican said they plan to discuss the challenges in incarnating the gospel in the present social and cultural conditions. This is the fourth meeting of its kind after Benedict XVI established the commission in 2007. Religious tensions are on the rise in France, where more than 60 people have been arrested for protesting the government's ban on wearing burqas in public. That ban went into effect today. A police official said the arrests were made over fears of increased public disorder following threats of counter-protests. The ban applies not only to Islamic veils, but to any garment that hides a person's face. Violators could face a $215 fine and be required to take a citizenship course. The fines are even steeper, as much as $86,000, if a person forces a woman to cover her face. The U.S. Bishops' Conference is reporting that the number of victims of sexual abuse continues to drop. A report prepared by Georgetown University's Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate shows there were seven credible accusations of abuse by priests in 2010. Additionally, hundreds of accounts of sexual abuse from decades ago were reported for the first time. Most of those allegations occurred in the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s, and almost half of the offenders have either died or been removed from the priesthood. Well, the wait is over, and the Holy See has finally announced the feast day for John Paul II, October 22nd, the day John Paul was inaugurated as Pope. Normally, feast days are celebrated on the date of a person's death. Uh, John Paul died on April 2nd, but uh, as that day typically falls during Holy Week, the Vatican's Congregation for Divine Worship settled on the October date. Until he's canonized, John Paul's feast can only be celebrated in Rome and in his home country of Poland. Meanwhile, preparations for his beatification have taken another step forward. Well, the new location for John Paul's remains has been prepared, the altar in the chapel of St. Sebastian, which is located inside St. Peter's Basilica. The remains of Pope Innocent IX were moved to make way for John Paul. The Vatican spokesman says the location is appropriate as it is near the entrance to the basilica and next to Michelangelo's masterpiece of Renaissance sculpture, the Pieta. Well, back in Brooklyn, Bishop DiMarzio was honored this weekend by a unique school here in the diocese. We sent our cameras to Coney Island for that special occasion. Welcome to the 47th annual Prosper Dinner Dance. This evening, we feel very privileged to welcome Bishop DiMarzio, the Bishop of Brooklyn, our honoree this year. If it were not for the deep-rooted dedication of Bishop DiMarzio to students with special needs, I would have to wonder where we would be right now. It's nice to be honored, but the cause is a very good cause. And again, by being honored, we bring people to the dinner, which is a fundraiser for our, the special education school. Uh, named after St. Catherine Labore. As you know, since 1960s, we've had a special education school where we can uh, educate those children who are developmentally challenged. I feel very uh, uh, close to the program as I know exactly how it works. I know the good things it does. We service children with special needs um, under the populations of learning disabilities, speech impairments, and mental retardation. The diocese has been extremely committed all these years. They've helped us um, with materials. They make contacts with us uh, in ways that we would not be able to do as a small singular program maybe standing on its own. And pretty much um, any kind of support that we need, um, we're able to go to the diocese and seek assistance when we need to. Bishop DiMazio, please accept the Sister Nora Bacher Award for your continuous dedication to the needs of the children in our diocese who are most in need of God's blessings. Thank you all for being here tonight. We hope that these children prosper. And with your help and with all of the work that's being done in the school, I'm sure they will. So God bless each and every one of you. <laughs> And the movie Soul Surfer rode a wave of positive reviews to take in the fourth highest total at the box office this weekend. It tells the true story of a young surfer who beats the odds and returns to surfing, to the surfing circuit, after her arm was bit off by a shark. 
The movie ranked, raked in rather more than $11 million in its opening weekend. Stay tuned. There's much more Currents ahead. When we return, some Catholics can't seem to make it to their local parish for Mass, but these young people walked 13 and a half miles. It was very long, but very good. It was nice to walk with a group of people, walking for a cause, and stopping at these beautiful historical churches was really magnificent, actually. Welcome back. Well, in this day and age of multitasking and gadgets that do everything from keep you in touch with your friends to help you in ordering your next meal, it should come as no surprise that people try to get in the most that they can out of every activity. And that might also include their spirituality. This weekend, a hodgepodge of Catholic young adult groups in the Archdiocese of New York sponsored the second annual pilgrimage through Manhattan. Yeah, you heard that right. The men and women walking over 13 miles from the top of Manhattan to the bottom stopping at churches along the way to work out their legs and exercise their soul. Now that's multitasking. The journey took place on a marvelous Saturday afternoon and our cameras made the trip too. Oh God, we ask that you watch over us, your servants, as we walk in the love of your name through the island of Manhattan. Be for us our companion on the walk. The walk is hard, you know, it's tiring but you're doing it for God. It's a great Lenten activity because we are praying, we are walking. It's fun, but it's also spiritual at the same time. Walking from the top of Manhattan to the south of Manhattan, literally, for about 13 and a half to about 14 miles. We're starting off at Mother Cabrini again, and we're going to be going to Corpus Christi Church, as well as uh, the Church of St. Joseph down the village, as well as the Church of St. Andrew near the uh, courthouses. And we'll end off with the closing mass at the shrine of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. Each pilgrimage I've been on, there's been something in particular that, that I've, I've really just wanted to show my gratitude to him. I'm thankful for my son. He's in the military, he's in the Navy. Right now his assignment is, is one that's stateside. So I, I carry the gratitude for that in my heart. And I also carry his classmates and the, the men and women that they're leading. Um, in their missions around the world. I want to wish you a very beautiful pilgrimage, walking with the saints, especially with Mother Cabrini, who start walking from here. We try to give them the spirit of Mother Cabrini, how she was, how she wanted the young people to be, because she loved the young people, Mother Cabrini. She was always thinking of them and trying to give them the best. It's a pilgrimage with the Lord in New York, big city, big apple, and very glad, very pleased to join this uh, pilgrimage. It's a really good way of uh, meditating on this time of Lent and learning um, about our American saints. Uh, good way of spending time also with our friends and just praying along the way. It's a marvelous walk with God from uh, up at Mother Cabrini down to Lower Manhattan, and it's a beautiful day. Just to be close to God, we decided that would be a wonderful way to spend a Saturday. Thomas Merton, the great American spiritual writer, was baptized in our church in November of 1938. I am so pleased that the young adults chose this particular church. First of all, because I think Merton is an important person for them to know. Also, it's interesting for them to see how a church in a, a very academic and ecumenical neighborhood can interact with all of the other groups and has for all of its existence. I learned a lot about the history of some of these churches, something I didn't know, and it definitely did interest me in trying to find out more, not just about the faith, but also about, you know, the history of the archdiocese and of the Catholic Church in general. You were not on a hike, you were not on a, uh, a walk, you were on a pilgrimage. And I think that word is a very powerful and beautiful word. All life is a pilgrimage, uh, from the beginning of our baptism to the last dying day that we have. And if we're on a pilgrimage with the Lord, it's a great, great time. And what these young people did today was a, a mini uh, view of the, their whole life. A great journey there. We'll stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up. 
Coming up, a bishop's blessing for these children. We'll take you there. We want them to be blessed and to prepare better uh, for Easter, not with Easter bunnies and eggs and baskets, but with their spiritual preparation. And finally tonight, for the past 10 years, the Parish of Sacred Hearts in St. Stephen's in Carroll Gardens has observed a tradition drawn from Scripture that came from the very mouth of Jesus. When the disciples tried to stop children from approaching Jesus, He told them, let the children come to Me. And they did. And this past Sunday's sort of modern day equivalent, well, the children of Sacred Hearts in St. Stephen's were invited to the altar and received a blessing from Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio in anticipation of the observance of Holy Week which is the last week of Lent in preparation for Easter Sunday. Our cameras were there. We come together today at this fifth Sunday of Lent to recognize that uh, Easter is ever that much closer. Our gospel today speaks to us about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Well, today's a regular Sunday Mass, the fifth Sunday of Lent, and people have come. Uh, there's a special blessing for children. This is the tradition of the parish before Easter to have a blessing for children. And the, uh, some religious articles are distributed to the people present. So it's a, kind of a, a day preparing us for Easter. The blessing of the children is something that we started here about um, 10 years ago when I first came. And what I was hoping to do is to preserve um, the image of Jesus in the gospel, surrounded by children and family. Remember how, how important children were to the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. They were the ones singing, Hosanna to the Son of David. They were the ones who recognized that Jesus was somebody special. And we must rely on the innocence of our children still to recognize the love of God in our lives and how much God loves them. It's the simplicity of children teaches us a lot about faith. I mean, you listen to children, sometimes they say such profound things, uh, saying out of the mouths of babes comes prof profound uh, wisdom. It's so true that they see things more clearly, perhaps simply, and uh, are really believers. I think that they have, um a kind of innocent reliance on God. And I think that it's a reliance that has no hold on them, but one that is totally uh, in which they give themselves into the arms of the Father. Well, hopefully today with the blessing that they recognize that Easter is the central mystery of our faith and we're preparing them to receive that. We want them to be blessed and to prepare better uh, for Easter, and not with all of the paraphernalia that surrounds Easter, Easter bunnies and eggs and baskets, but with their spiritual preparation. So as we prepare in these last two weeks for Easter, we recognize that the world wants to hope in life, wants to understand Jesus' promise of eternal life. My blessing to the children is that they continue to be part of this community, that they begin, they continue to be part of the parish uh, community and the celebration of the Eucharist. Great time for those kids and everyone who was there. I know the bishop really, bishop really said it all when he said, you know, kids sometimes say, uh, <laughs> say kids say the darndest things, but uh, you know, kids say the most profound things kind of in the simplest of ways. And I think just as human beings, as important as it is for us to look to our elders to learn, we can also look to children and the young to learn as well, because they do say important and profound things a lot of times in very simple ways that are easy for us to understand and can speak to us, I think, in a big, big way. Well, that is it for this edition of Currents. Now, be sure and join us tomorrow as we visit a church everyone is worshipped in. And no, it is not the world-famous one on Madison Avenue. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching and have a good night.